Hello and welcome back to another session. Today we are going to learn in detail about Amazon S3, Simple Storage Service. Let's get started. Before getting into this session, if you want to know about an overview of all AWS storage services, please check out the video in the description. Okay, in today's session, we are going to cover fundamentals of S3, the associated storage classes, key features that S3 offers, and how the pricing model works in S3. S3 is used to store and retrieve any amount of unstructured data called objects from anywhere in the world. Objects includes all types of files like images, videos, or audios of any format. There are no limitations. S3 is a global service. What does it mean? S3 bucket names are globally unique. So you can't have no two buckets with same names across all AWS accounts. That's the reason it's referred to as global service. Otherwise, your buckets actually stay in the region where you upload them to. So all the objects that are uploaded to S3 are stored within containers called buckets. So buckets acts more or less like folders within which you can store the files. Buckets help in managing the access of the objects, like who can view or edit the data, and it helps you in auditing with access logs, and also allows you to set regions under which you want to store the objects. While there are no limitations on the number of objects that can be stored in S3, there is a limitation on the object size. A single object can be from 0 bytes to 5 terabytes, and a single put operation allows uploading 5 GB of data. And if you are uploading more than 100 MB of data, you could use multi-part upload, which is just uploading your data in parts rather than doing it all at once. So these are the basics of S3. S3 offers various types of storage classes, which controls the way your data can be accessed and comes with different pricing models. Each storage class is designed for specific use cases. There are seven storage classes. Let's see what are they. First in the list is S3 Standard, which is designed for frequently accessed data. This offers the low latency and high throughput, so it's ideal for data that you for sure know is going to be accessed more often. The next one is Intelligent Tiering, which is best for data with changing access patterns. If you select the storage class, S3 automatically moves your data between two access tiers, one for frequent access and other for infrequent access, based on the access patterns, which helps you in saving costs. Next in the list is standard IA, where IA stands for infrequent access. So it's for data which are not accessed often. It's mainly used to store backups and comes handy for disaster recovery use cases. One zone IA is again to store infrequently accessed data. However, here the data is stored only in a single availability zone. Glacier is for storing archive data and the retrieval times range from minutes to hours. Glacier deep dive is also used to store archive data, but the retrieval times will always be in hours in this case, so it can be used for data which are rarely accessed. Last in the list is reduced redundancy, which is used for storing frequently accessed non-critical data, which can be reproduced easily. So the durability of the data is only two nines here. It's not recommended to use reduced redundancy class considering the decreased durability factor. These are some of the useful details which helps in determining the storage class that can be used for your specific use case. All the storage classes comes with high durability, 11 nines, except for the reduced redundancy, which has only two nines. Most of the storage classes have a 99.99% availability. Only the infrequent access ones will have a little less availability of 99.9 or 99.5%. Minimum billable object size is not applicable for standard and intelligent tiering classes. Standard IA and one zone IA has a minimum billable size has 128 KB. So your objects must be at least 128 KB 
even if your object size is below that you will be charged for 128 kb glacier and deep archive has minimum billable size as 40 kb minimum storage duration tells you how long you have to at least store an object in a particular class it's not applicable for standard for intelligent ia and one zone ia it's 30 days and glacier is 90 days and deep archive is 180 days if you delete your object in any of the storage classes before the minimum duration then it will incur you a prorated charge which is equal to the storage charge for the remaining days so if you have an object in glacier and you deleted it in 60 days still you will end up paying for the remaining 30 days to cover the minimum duration criteria Retrieval fee is charge that apply to retrieve or access your data. It's not applicable for standard and intelligent tiering. And for the rest, it's charge per GB basis. First byte latency is the amount of time it takes to retrieve your first byte of data from your objects. It's in milliseconds for all the storage classes, except for Glacier ones which takes minutes or hours as they are archived data. Next section in this session is an interesting one covering some of the key features that S3 offers. Access points. In general, your S3 buckets and objects within them will be accessed by multiple users and applications and without access points, you have to control all these access restrictions by writing complex bucket policies, which are JSON documents. When you have more and more number of users accessing your objects, you have to be very careful in updating the bucket policies because it might result in some getting additional or less access if not done properly. So to overcome this, S3 introduced access points, which can be created for every user or application and their access can be managed individually rather than a single complex bucket policy. Batch operations, as the name suggests, S3 allows us to perform a bunch of actions on billions of objects all at once. So how you do this is by creating a job specifying the list of objects, actions to perform, and parameters required for the action. Once you set up the job, S3 takes care of managing it and send you the reports, notifications about the execution. You could use this to copy objects or tag them or update metadata all at once for all the objects. Block public access is used to secure your data from unauthorized access. It's a straightforward one. You block all public access to your bucket. You could do it at account level as well. Cost optimization. Storage classes are the key when it comes to reducing the cost. As we saw before, different storage classes have various features and they cost you based on the features offered. So during the lifetime of the object, you can move it across different storage classes by setting lifecycle policies, which helps in reducing the cost. For example, when your object is frequently accessed, have them in a standard class. And after a few days, when they are no longer used much, those could be moved to Glacier or archived or automatically. Replications. You can set cross-region or same-region replication based on your need. This can be used to achieve various use cases like following complaints and standards, grouping logs across all regions into a single region for easy access, regional efficiency by reducing the latency of the object near the user. Continuing with the list of features. Next on the list is hosting a static website. Yes, you can configure S3 for hosting your own website with client-side scripts. However, it does not allow dynamic pages with server-side scripts as there are other services for that purpose. It also supports cross-site resource sharing, course, which helps in accessing resources from different domains. Versioning enables you to preserve and restore all versions of your object. It's very useful to preserve and secure your data. You can also add another layer of security by enabling MFA delete, which requires an additional authentication to delete your objects. 
object locks can prevent an object from being deleted or overridden for a fixed amount of time or indefinitely. It uses a write once and read many worm model. Bucket policies and ACLs, that is access control lists, are essential to control access to your buckets or objects. You can get more granular and specify access restrictions even for a single resource or user. Access logs records the details of the requests made to a bucket, which helps in auditing. So those were some of the cool features that S3 offers. Next, let's see about pricing. So when it comes to pricing, you pay for what you use and it is determined by five factors. First is the storage. It includes things like size of your object, how long you store the object and the storage class you use to store the object. Request and data retrieval costs, which consists of all the operations you perform on the object, lifecycle transitions and data retrievals. Data transfer charges, you pay for the bandwidth of the data going into and out of S3. Management cost, which includes usage of additional features like inventory, analytics, or tagging. Replications related costs or for cross region and same region replications. We are at the end of the session, so let's do a quick recap. S3 is an amazing storage service offered by AWS, which comes with many cool features. It supports seven storage classes, which can be used for various purposes and use cases. We saw many features which they offer, including costs, optimization, replication, versioning, website hosting, access controls, and many more. Lastly, the pricing is calculated based on your usage and these factors, storage, data retrieval, transfer, management, and replication related costs. In the next session, we will have an hands-on demo of S3 covering most of the topics discussed today. If you have any questions related to this session, please leave them in the comments below. We'll see you in the next video.